Ladies and gentlemen, this is Julian Mason from Adrenaline Combatives, and I am with Mr. Chris Roberts from Safe International. How are you? Mr. Mr. Thank you very much. Mr. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's great. I was really looking forward to, to have you on the show. Uh, we had to pull a few strings, like, you know, we had to get Richard to to to, to turn your brains a little bit to, to get on there. That's great. That's great to have you here, man. Um, so, do you, I, I think I think just just I wanted to 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 mention. I think you got you got a little problem with your voice. Yes. Yeah, I might as well bring it up right up front because you know how I get yeah, so yeah. conscious about it. But yeah, teaching for thirty years, about fifteen years ago, I was teaching. <clears throat> we would teach eight thousand high school kids a year, and thought I got laryngitis, and apparently it wasn't laryngitis. I've got this neurological condition that uh, it's actually not bad at the moment, mm -hmm. where I get Botox injections from my voice. So people will hear it go high, low. You hear me, you know, it, it doesn't hurt at all. It, it's just challenging to speak sometimes, and, and I like to talk, and somebody's trying to shut me up. I think it's my wife, but good luck with that. So we'll just carry on, and hopefully it's uh, clear enough that people can understand what I'm saying. Well, I can I can hear you loud and clear, man. And I know you got a lot of gold nuggets of knowledge to put out there, and that's that's what that's what I see, and that's what people with a brain should see. So, do you want to give us do you want to give us a little uh, introduction about who you are, what you do, what's your specialty, and then we'll we'll get into it. Sure, I probably came into this industry a little different than most, but I've got one similarity with Richard, actually, is I, you know, grew up, I was going to go into the hotel food industry, owner of a Burger King restaurant, part owner, etc. And similar to Richard is I was running a Burger King in a town that was pretty rough. And I started to take karate. Um, I'd always had an interest in all the typical the Bruce Lee movies and all that stuff. But I thought, you know, maybe I need to learn to protect myself because the restaurant was pretty rough on weekends and uh, took karate through that, developed an interest in self-defense. I mm -hmm. seemed to have some, okay, Dad and my instructor said, you should probably teach the stuff. You seem to be pretty natural at it. So 1994, I started teaching my first high school then eventually, you know, we were teaching up to 80 high schools a year, taught over 200,000 people, and the courses completely evolved over time. It's very different than it was in the beginning. Um, and one thing I know that I made different was I never catered to the typical people that take self-defense. My <clears throat> focus has been on regular people. And how it can help because the majority of people are never going to do a self-defense course in their lifetime. And if they do, they might take four hours. Mm. So if you had four hours with somebody, what would you teach them? If they want to train longer, great. But that sort of course is formulated on um, helping regular people. And you know, I've taught teens, mothers, families, corporate, um, worked a lot with First Nations, Indigenous communities, and uh, sort of where we are today. Wow. I mean, you know, I, that's something I've started to think about more recently because, as, as you know, I mean, I've started the martial arts when I was really young and I, and I really very quickly got to the pragmatic aspect of, you know, the, the boxing, the tie boxing, the MMA, all that stuff. And so it's always been a hardcore journey for me. But now, a bit more recently, as I, as I got a bit more in depth into observing what you guys do with Richard and, and a few others. Uh, I asked myself, okay, how do I teach the average person that doesn't know how to fight? And the average person that has been victim of violence before, <laughs> that traumatized, that has got difficulties opening up, that has got difficulties facing their, their fears and finding the, 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 the strength within themselves to actually face their their challenger, which very often also are people that they know, which changes the whole dynamic of of, of self protection training now. So you're no longer dealing with uh, the street thug that's uh, attacking you in the dark street. Uh, first of all, you know if you got if you got the street smarts and the situational awareness, environmental awareness, you're not going to be there. But now we're talking about a completely different uh, type of um, uh, how, how do you call that? Abuser, not even an assailant, but an ab abuser. And so, me asking myself this question kind of uh, led me to 
have a completely different look at what I'm doing. And, and I'm starting slowly to kind of branch into two different, you know, into the 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 uh, the direction that, that you guys took, which is violence prevention for the average person. And of course, you know, I'm, I'm, I will always be into my, my martial arts, my hardcore martial arts. So I will always attract one type of person as well. But I don't want to only attract one type of person. I want to be able to help those that really need it as well. And that's where I find what you guys do really interesting because you guys are thinking outside the box compared to a lot of people. See, and that's why I don't why I don't understand why it should be considered yeah, thinking outside the box. Mm. Like day one when I started, I always had a violence prevention part to my course in high school. Yeah. I just never thought there was an alternative. I just always did it. And maybe that's because I wasn't so ingrained in the industry to see what other people were doing. Yeah. I didn't know what other people do. I thought self-defense, I'm going to teach in schools. So I should probably start with how to avoid. So I, I don't, it was never, it was just always part of how I taught. Yeah. And two is, is a lot of people when they start self-defense business, they will learn what they've learned um, through their instructors. And then they teach that where I truly, I tell people that the program we teach, it's, it, my clients taught me what to teach <clears throat> mm. by listening to their stories. What they're going through is what's really formulated the curriculum. So the students that we've taught over the years have formed the curriculum, not me. I mean, sure, I for structure it, but it's based on what I saw, what I heard, making changes. So I didn't force a curriculum on people. I let the curriculum adapt based to what <clears throat> our clients we're saying, hearing, and you know, you talk about people that have trained in combatives and stuff from mindset for years, but I bet lots of average people never done a course of a lifetime have a lot stronger mindset mm. than people in combatives. So there's that part of it too. We assume because they don't have any training, they must be weak in these areas, but that's not the case. Yeah. You know, a lot of times very strong, mm. you know, and yeah. they just don't know what to tie it to or when it might come in, and, you know, useful. But yeah, really. The, the people I've taught have developed the same curriculum, not me so much. Yeah, but that's 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 great. That's like a completely different approach. Is that instead of focusing your teaching on what you've been taught, that's that's where you see it's a bit of a okay. I teach you that curriculum. You pass down that curriculum because this is what I taught you, and you'll pass it down exactly as I as I gave it to you because this is the curriculum, and I don't want it water down in any way shape or form that that's a very very um traditional martial arts type of mindset isn't it yeah and interesting too is i've done certifications over the years and i remember one time doing a certification <clears throat> with a very popular program and we were doing one physical attack and even though i've been teaching for 10 years i was still looking what would help the client it's always about what will keep the client safer. And I remember questioning a defense to a certain attack and I was sincere in my question. And I was told, because that's how we do it. So I realized very quickly, don't ask questions, <laughs> just do what I tell you. And interesting, that person also had said to me, Chris, you know, why don't you teach my program in schools? Cause he knew how busy I was. And I said, well, I kind of got a good thing going. He goes, well, don't you want to teach something better? And I said, with all due respect, you don't even know what I do, what I teach. Mm -hmm. So that attitude I saw pr pretty early on that somebody, well, what I'm teaching must be better than what you're teaching, et cetera. And just that, that was such a... My Kung Fu, my Kung Fu is better than yours. Yeah, just and he goes, and, <laughs> But that's where Richard and I got along so well is even, you know, I've had people, I mean, I remember once I sent some funny message to, or a comment to Richard and somebody said, you talk to Richard Dimitri like that? Okay, he's just a fucking asshole like the rest of us. You know, he's no different than anybody. But Rich and I, when we became really good friends, we would discuss parts of the curriculum. Mm. And if he had a differing opinion than me, we never discussed it where I want to be right, he wants to be. It's always what's best for the clients, what we saw the kids doing, and it was always for them. There was mm. never, I'm right, you're wrong. Yeah. And that's how it should be, but I don't know if that's common. Well, that, that's that's where you see that this relationship, even this pair, you know, pair uh, to pair relationship, 
is very often ego driven and ego based. It's like who's the bigger dog? You know what I mean? And I and I've seen that, and I you know I I awakened to that even more recently in the last year. Realized that fucking hell, it's this this industry. It's it's very ego driven, and you know, and people will call you out, uh, tell you you have ego and stuff, which which you do. We all have yeah, ego. Yeah, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. But it's it's it seems to be like very who's the big who's the biggest dog do you know what i mean who's yeah. the biggest it's always a competition who's the biggest dog even though they don't want to admit it uh out loud in the open they're like no no it's not about ego it's about helping people and stuff which it yeah. is yes but don't fucking say that it's not about ego either yeah. i can clearly see it i can clearly feel it that you're always in a competition mode who's the biggest dog do you know what i mean so yeah i see yeah, it. Even, yeah like when i'm teaching I'd be a lie to say I don't feel good getting the attention. Oh yeah. Of course I feel great, fantastic. Mm. I always loved it. That's why when I lost my voice, it became a different. Oh, I don't feel so good now because people are looking at me mm. a bit different, right? But of course, there's a lot of ego in it, you know. And even of one of the most common comments I get when I go to teach, or you know, especially from men, is like, "Well, you don't look like a self-defense guy because I don't look the part." Uh, right I go good because that would probably come in very handy in some circumstances if i had to defend myself yeah you know, it could be a negative as well right but it's interesting how with men when i would teach them i'd almost have to do something physically for them to go oh maybe this guy knows what he's talking about yeah, yeah, yeah. with women and teens I, I rarely ever i never really encounter mm. that I feel I feel like that what you just said is something that I, I I have experienced many many times in my life and unfortunate it's very unfortunate because I'll tell you a little story I mean one one of many I don't like I'm not a person that likes to intimidate people but but sometimes I feel like it's the only way for people to show you respect so it's like I was working on a building site in Glasgow uh, which is Scotland it's a bit of a crazy part of Scotland you know and I lived there I used to train with Tommy Carruthers in uh, in Glasgow that's that's why I moved over there and so I was working on a building site and you know on building sites you have these these big containers where the office the office is inside a container on the top of yeah. containers and so the top container upstairs is the stairs going up there and it's like the uh, the site manager's office and so you always have a couple of site manager or one site manager and some site supervisors and uh, and every now and then you have an apprentice who is a young lad who wants to become who's still at the college and who wants to become a site manager and who is doing his apprenticeship and because he's where he is and i was just a, a ground worker slash laborer He's seen me in his head. He was like, you're beneath me. You're below me. And so I'm a very polite guy, Chris. You know, when I got there every morning, I was going to sign in and I was, hi, guys, how are you doing? You know, I always say hi. I always say, please, thank you. I'm, I've been raised to be, a, to be a, a polite person. Do you know what I mean? And so every time I, I was saying hi to that, everybody was answering. When I was saying hi to that young lad, he wasn't even looking at me. I could really sense that energy of I'm better than you. You're, you're just a fucking little fucking laborer. You just drive dumpers and stuff, bring people the fucking uh, shingles and sand and this and that. I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to become a site, uh, site manager. That's, that's what I could sense from his energy. And so, and one day, I, I mean, I, I thought, fuck it. But, you know, I get really pissed off about that sort of thing because I'm a nice guy and I could be intimidating people. I surely have enough skill set to be able to intimidate people if I wanted to. Uh, but I don't do it because I'm a good guy. I don't feel that it's needed. So it kind of upsets me when people take liberties because they think they're there, but they got no idea of what you can do. And so one day uh, we're on the break. And I see him uh, upstairs. He's just out upstairs having a cigarette outside the office. And I, I did like I didn't see him. He didn't know that I saw him. And I, I was just uh, texting on my phone. And there was a metal bar just above my head. And I kicked it really fucking rapid like I know how to do. <laughs> and, and then I went inside the canteen. Do you know what I mean? And after that, every single day when I was saying hi to him, he was like, oh, how are you doing, bro? You good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know his attitude had changed because he realized that I could knock him the fuck out with one with with one kick. Do you know what I mean? But why? Why does he need to get there? Do you know that's yeah. that's, that's what I don't get, man. Well, it's funny because you know how COVID, as you can imagine, totally annihilated 
my business right for a while there mm -hmm. and so the first time in 27 years because i've been teaching full-time for 27 years I had to get my first regular job at a local place and uh one of the first shifts there you know i'm 58 years old right and this other yeah. older guy he starts to like bully me right yeah, you get so bullied, yeah yeah, so I looked at him, I go, are you trying to bully me right now? And I started smiling and laughing, yeah, right? Yeah. And he goes, uh, never, and he, he took off because he realized it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Then later he sees me, goes, I just want to apologize. I heard what you do for a living. I go, why should that even matter what I do for a living? I, and, I'm, I, and I'm friendly with him. Yeah. Hold of resentment, but it's interesting how even at my age, 58, people still want to try to bully you. That's why, that's why, Chris, that's why I'm, <clears throat> I'm trying really, really, really hard not to have to work for people anymore because I can't stand bullying. I've been bullied all my life. At first, it was physical bullying when I was a kid. Uh, and then it has gone from physical to being emotional bullying, even in adulthood. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's like I can't stand that shit. That's why I do what I do as well, because I don't want people to I want to help it. If you know, I don't want people to get bullied. But you go to get a new job in construction or somewhere, you will get bullied. That's just the way things yeah. work. It's this military hierarchy, hierarchy mindset of you're beneath me, so you're going to take shit from me. When you get here, then you'll be able to fucking give yeah. shit to the people below you. Do you know what I mean? It's like, fuck this, man. Uh, well, that's why even with my biggest you know, motivation now is my grandkids, right? And they're they're almost the one, you know, they're almost seven, five, and the other one's two. But by the, the five-year-old, the four-year-old, we were at swimming lessons, and uh, she's on the swing. And I'm just about 10 feet away. Boy comes over twice her size goes to push her. Mm. I, so I stand back, she turns, she goes, no! And the kid runs off, almost crying to his mother. Mm. So I talked to her after, how did that feel? Because he tried to take my swing. I wasn't going to let him. Good. So that's, uh, if watching and helping the grandkids to deal with yeah. that, but also uh, teach them to be kind, empathetic people, right? So yeah. that's the age when it's almost got to start. So that's my yeah. mission now is make sure the grandkids, mm. like I said, I can't die before they're prepared to take care of themselves. And uh, mm. Mm. You know, that, that's, but, that's great to think like that. You know, it's like because the – the, the the way that that civilization is the way that the society is nowadays they're not we're not being taught how to think as kids we're being told what to think we're being taught to fit inside the mold or be a weirdo and be branded a weirdo like i have been you know what i mean drawing at school instead of like drawing like uh, dragon ball z characters at school instead of learning because i wasn't interested uh do you know what I mean? You're branded. You're, you're branded. Not normal. Weirdo. ADHD. Autistic. This, that. And, you know, and, and then it creates traumas because you're like, OK, if everybody's judging me for all these years, then maybe there's something wrong with me. And you start believing in it as, as an adolescent until you, you, you develop enough emotional intelligence as an adult to go, wait a second, there's nothing wrong with me. There's something terribly wrong with the system, with the with the educational system, with with the society as it is today. So I, I think it's very important for kids that have difficulties adapting. So kids that like myself that was suffering of ADHD and things like that, hyperactivity, always moving. My my leg was twitching all the time. I couldn't I couldn't stop. Uh, so kids like this need to be reassured. That yeah. there's nothing wrong with them. That they, you know, they, it's just the society is not prepared to deal with this with, with, with these kids. Well, I think I'm. I would be. You know, we all hopefully get smarter and wiser. Mm. But I think I'm a better grandfather than I was a father. I like to think I was a decent father, right? But even with the grandkids, I still remember the first daughter, granddaughter dancing when she was like two, and her looking at us for approval. And I think, holy shit, like kids at that early age you see and some kids the sad part is some kids just don't have a chance in life almost right from the day they're born with their circumstances so but i remember looking and and even the other day the kids said uh, can we do self-defense guy because they call me guy and i said um sure i said how about we talk first 
okay, so we talk about these things, right? And then we'll do some physical stuff. And, and it's the belting act. I remember the older da granddaughter was hitting the heavy bag and I hear the four-year-old in the background, go for the eyes. It's like, oh shit, I better be careful what I'm like. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, at such an early age, they're looking for approval on how many parents are just turns out you look silly, right? And it yeah, starts so there. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm trying to improve and I think I'm better now. Mm. I'm more aware now, where I'm sure I didn't notice it as much with my kids when they were growing up. Do you know it's it's almost it's almost like it's almost like we should we should we like human beings should really wait to be a certain age before to become a dad almost. I mean, for, I mean, we're all different at the end of the day, like. But because if if we haven't dealt with our own traumas, then these traumas are going to transpire onto our children, and we don't even do it in purpose because we obviously want what's best for our children, but because we're still suffering inside, these 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 flares up. And and this end up transpiring onto onto our children's life, like you say, the kids. That's the first mode of mode of um, operation where they do something and they look at us like they're looking for approval. Yeah. Is that okay? Can I do this? Is it is it good or is it bad? Do you know what I mean? And that's where we need to be really careful how how we uh, how we format yeah. our hard drive from. It's those little there. sentences. We don't realize the impact that they have, right? Like, and then it, it's funny because I remember dancing, and then one day I started to dance, and my one granddaughter goes, "Guy, never do that again." And that's hilarious, though, right? Mm. You know, like she saw me dancing a lot. But yeah, I, I, I just that's the age when ideally, if you can work with the kids, and same with um high schools, I quickly realized that. You know, we're having fun, but when you got 30 kids in front of you, mm. certain things you're saying, you don't realize the impact they're having. Like 28 of the kids might be laughing, having fun listening and learning, yeah. where the one or two are leaning forward. And you know, that's who I'm talking to right now, mm. right? And being yeah. able to identify. So I always say, I'm not teaching 20, a group of 20 people, I'm teaching 20 individuals. Yeah. And can you get good at identifying who you're speaking to and, you know, who you're having the most impact on? And like I posted once how a, a woman I taught in high school met, emailed me 15 years later and she said, I, she was, you won't remember me. I took your course 15 years ago and this is what I remember from your course. She basically typed out the whole fucking curriculum. It was amazing. I was like, wow, somebody listened that carefully. And she'd gotten into a domestic violence situation. She survived it. And it, the, her ex, her husband tried to take her, kill, take her life with a pillow over her face. Mm. We didn't cover a pillow defense, right? Yeah. But she remembered the principles and concepts and had the mindset, you know? So you never know what you're saying to anybody. The impact and what might be frivolous to one person could be life-changing to another. It's like you're planting seeds of knowledge that will flourish into into something. Do you know? It's like what I was saying to you earlier. <clears throat> I uh, even now that I'm getting more and more interested into into that approach. You know, the violence prevention and and the trauma informed approach of how do we avoid making the situation worse for certain people? And I look at some of my videos of some of my seminars, maybe a couple of years ago. And knowing what I know now, I'm listening to what I just said. And I'm like, oh, shit, I shouldn't have said that. You know, some people might have thought I was patronizing them by saying what I said, how I said it. Oh, it obviously wasn't my intention to do right. so, but I wasn't careful enough uh, what I was saying and how I was saying it. And, I, and some people might have thought, oh, is he, you know, is he patronizing me or so? But yeah. the thing to do. You've learned from that as well. I mean, I'm sure I said lots of things 15, 20, even five years ago that mm. if I could see it or in retrospect to going, oh, I shouldn't have said it that way. Right. But it's it's what you do with that information. You move forward and try to get better. Like I'm always trying to become a better instructor, mm. or, you know, coach or whatever you want to call it. Listener. Yep. That's what advantage of my voice condition is. I always like to think I was a good listener. But I became an even better listener because I was self-conscious of talking. So I thought, well, I'll listen more. And in a lot of ways, as much as I never would want to have had this condition, it has benefited me 
in some ways forced me to be a better listener. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you know, that that's that's one thing. That's a big thing. Like learning to listen. And I remember back, I mean, a, a good 10, 10 years ago, maybe even more, 11 years, 12 years ago, it was the first time that I've been taught. Uh, it, it probably wasn't the first time, but it's the first time that I really heard it, that <clears throat> I was talking too much and I wasn't listening enough. And that was, you know, mainly uh, my, uh, my ex-wife uh, wife at the time yeah. that was telling me that I wasn't listening and I wasn't uh, acknowledging her, I wasn't seeing her, I wasn't listening to her. And so at some point, I just decided to be self-conscious and just to have a look within, you know, and, and I realized, oh, yeah, you know, it's like I do speak a lot. And, and even before, I used to really try to monopolize the, the conversation. It was just a need, a need of me, 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 a need of be heard, a need of, of just putting my point across to the detriment of... of <clears throat> giving other people the time to <clears throat> to put their own point across and so i had to learn that that's a skill i had to learn to listen and that fits perfectly into what i said before about the clients have developed the curriculum because if i didn't listen to the client stories and i thought well i know better than them here's what they need to know i wouldn't have heard the stories they've gone through, the trauma, the situations are watched. So by listening, that, it's like when I used to be guilty of this. And one thing when people send me a curriculum, Chris, I was thinking of teaching this in four hours. What do you think? I go, you won't get through half of that. But I understand it because I used to be guilty of that. I've got to give them as much information as possible. Yeah. But over time, I realized if I give them half the information, but listen to them, I've done uh, given them a hundred times more value. Yeah, you know, that's really interesting what you're saying, because I can relate to that. When I first started to teach my seminars more seriously, I mean, I've always taught a few seminars here and there. I used to teach with my father as I was growing up. But it's really in 2017, 2018 that I started really to teach like my own seminars and having people coming to, to, to those seminars. And shit, I remember the first seminar was an eight-hour seminar. I wanted it to be super long because I had so much shit to put in there. I wanted to drop the whole curriculum uh, to them in eight hours. And I mean, some of the people that came to my first seminars were like proper game people. They loved it. They loved it because it, it was good for them. But I've had a few people telling me that's... That's too long. That's too harsh. Uh, you know, it's, it was really a really tiring day with the pressure test at the end and all the you know, impact inoculation and all that shit. It, it was like I realized now I still the same. I want to put so much out there in my programs. When I teach a seminar, I got a, a car combative uh, seminar coming up in November. And I'm so excited because I've been developing a program for the last five years. I uh, had to fight inside the car, had to isolate wrestling inside the car, had to isolate boxing inside the car, had to put it together, had to throw weapons in there, had to do scenarios and st stress tests and milling inside the car. And like, I, I just want to do everything, do you know what I mean? But yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm telling myself now, right, I got to break shit down and really take what really matters for that day. I got five hours on that day, minus 20 minute break. I got about, yeah, about four and a half hours to uh, to give some content that, that's going to be uh, absorbed, right, rightly so. You know? And you can be sure they've got a lot of questions, right? But if they don't feel comfortable, and it's like one of my, the funniest moments I find is when I do seminars with Richard on his content is virtually before every seminar, the guys would be warming up, stretching, and Rich and I would go, they're not going to do anything physical for two, three hours, but we're not going to tell them, yeah. right? And they would sit there like, when do we start hitting shit, right? Then they would start to calm down. Some of them would also be like, they like, almost upset they're not striking something yet. But then you'd see them start to listen. It was a shift like, okay, maybe I need to hear this information, mm. right? It was, it was yeah. funny just watch them warming up. Or even when I do my women's self-defense parties, I would typically schedule... 50% um, violence prevention, 50% physical. Yeah. And almost every time when I would get halfway through, I would say, okay, we have a decision to make. We could start the physical 
or if you want to continue talking on these topics, yeah. let's branch, we can do that. And almost every time they would go, let's keep talking. We didn't realize how much content there was and how interesting it could be. Yeah. Right. People have a, an idea what self-defense is, but when they hear what it should be, they, you'd be surprised how much more they want to talk and ask questions and discuss their own stories. It's 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 true, man. You know, I, I realized that recently. And now now that I got a bit more into the violence prevention aspect of things, I I actually have some uh, private students. I got one from Thailand. It's an American guy that lives in Thailand. And he that's what he wants to do. I mean, he obviously he does. He's a grappler. He does a bit of Thai boxing. He's in Thailand. He's, he's quite a high level grappler. Uh, I think he's in his. 50s maybe uh, but he's really really interested in the soft skills the the non-physical options the violence prevention the psychology of violence the, the 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 foundation of violence and all that stuff that's something and so i was like that to him i was saying okay like you know let's do 50 50 50 uh, theory and 50 practice and a good few times he was like you know what i mean just just crack on with the, th the theory. It's, it's, it's really interesting stuff. So for the first time in my life now, in this year, I have been providing like, a, like an hour private session, just, just talking basically, and the person yeah, yeah. taking notes. And although I'm a martial artist, I like, I, I like to use this. I like yeah. to hit the pads. I like to grapple. I like to strike. I like to spar. I like to do scenario training. I like to do all that stuff because yeah. that's me. But I find it much, much more uh, interesting now to actually talk about things because it opens you up to a completely different, different world when it comes to self-protection. And it gives you something that helps your physical. It gives you something that makes you even more ready to, to get physical yeah. if you have to. Because if they're prepared with all the, the mental side of it, the violence prevention, when it comes time to use the physical they're more prepared because there's no doubt I needed to use the physical because they've covered all the stuff before. It's like um, Stan Pederick, a guy in the West Coast of Canada, a uh, world champion kickboxer, et cetera, for years, flew yeah. out here to be certified with me. And it's interesting because we were discussing it and he said, all his friends are like, Stan, why are you doing a self-defense certification? You already know all this stuff. But Stan, being wise enough, said, no, this is an area that I haven't done that. And Stan said, oh my God, I learned so much. Mm. Thanks, Chris. So hearing that from someone with his, you know, experience yeah. and accolades, but again, that's keeping an open mind, right? I mean, if I went to learn kickboxing, holy shit, I'd go to him. That's yeah. not my area, you know, but that's, yeah, knowing what you're teaching and uh, keeping an open mind to it. And yeah, exactly. So. I, I think that with with this with this type of uh, this type of content, when you teach this type of content, it's like you make those teachings more accessible to those that really need it, and that's that's what we were saying. You know, uh, when um, when you look at the statistic and you realize that ninety percent of death, ninety percent of crimes are committed by or close to ninety percent of crimes are committed by people that you know, family members, uh, work colleagues, uh, you know, people at the gym, whatever. So it's like it changes the whole dynamic. It's like um, I was interviewing uh, Tony Blower the other day and he was saying, well, if you do scenario training and now all of a sudden you don't have to deal with the street mugger that you don't mind flattening his face. Now you got to deal with your drunk uncle. No, you can't flatten his face. You can't break his nose. You can't just you know smash him up. You got to find a way to uh, uh, get him to safety because he's drunk and he's picking fights with other family members. Uh, so he changes. It, it changes everything. You're like, yeah. oh, oh, okay. So how do I deal with this? How do I deal with the family member? Uh, yeah. How do I deal with Uncle, you know, Uncle Benny when I'm uh, when I'm eight years old, like an eight year old little girl, and and uh, Uncle Benny is 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 starting to touch me in an inappropriate way. It's, yeah, it's like when we were in Australia teaching the one time, 
I remember this one couple were telling us how they'd always told their kids, you know, if anybody ever harms you, tell us we'll kill them. And I understand that as a right, a parent, grandfather, but again, they didn't know it was the uncle, right, that was abusing their child. Mm -hmm. So what did the kid hear? You're going to kill my uncle who I love? Mm. Right, but and they and they you know, they didn't just didn't know any better, and then I, I I get it right, but it's understanding that I had a woman that um her husband had tried to kill her a few times, and she'd stayed in the relationship think he was safer for the kids, right? But she decided now she was going to <clears throat> report the guy to the police, but she was quite confident. Well, when I tell the police, he's going to try to kill me again. Mm. So her motive before was to not fight back think he was better for the kids not to break up the family, etc. But when she started to understand the importance of what well, I'm doing this for my kids, etc. Yeah. But you don't just teach somebody that in, okay, I taught you for an hour, you're good to go. Some people yeah. it might take years, could be months, you know, so I never have a, a timeline when I'm teaching, if it's a, a private client or, you know, it depends yeah. on their specific circumstance. I can't say, okay, you got your four hours, you're good to go. Or, you know, like a domestic violence guy pulling on the woman's hair, we'll just hit him in the face. Yeah. But it, it's not oh, that easy, simple, yeah. you know, and, but that's what makes the topic a bit fascinating to talk about too. Yeah. And interesting. That's why I've learned so much from the clients like Pam and Rich have taken a lot of that to a new level yeah. as well. Right. But, um, like, I can't tell you how many times I've had somebody after seminar say, Chris, I was in an abusive relationship for years. Um, and I, why didn't I leave sooner? Mm -hmm. And I'll say, I don't know your circumstance. You have kids, et cetera. So I say, but whatever you did, you're here alive telling me right now, whatever you did was amazing. And they always break down because I understand they probably been blaming themselves for years why haven't I that? And to say, if I said something like, yeah, you should have left years ago, how's that going to help? It's not going to help. Yeah. It's going to make it worse because now they're like, well, the expert yeah. told me I should have done what I thought I should have done. Yeah. Who am I to tell? They're alive. Yeah. Sure. Could you improve on it and learn from it? Yes. But to tell somebody as the, the expert listens and doesn't have answers, they have options. Yeah. It's like I start every seminar by saying, I won't have any answers for you today, only options. People go, what kind of expert are you? But by the end of the seminar, they understand because what works in one situation might be the worst thing to do in this very similar situation the next day. Yeah, that 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 is crazy. And, you know, it, one thing that I really started to and it's really Richard that, that you know, the, the work of Richard and yours as well, that kind of opened my eyes to the fact that a vast majority of the pop well not, not a majority but like a vast percentage of the population are suffering of some sort of personality disorder like like narcissistic personality disorder and you're like you end up being around people like this for years and even looking up to to people like this uh, you know which you know in itself i don't believe that People that are suffering of narcissistic personality disorder are all, are all bad. I don't think that they're bad people. They, they're just traumatized people that are taking, un, unfortunately and maybe unconsciously, taking it up on, on others and making others suffer when they're supposed to help others. So it's like that made me look at myself big time. That because when I look at the list, uh, the, the different list of, you know, how do you recognize narcissistic personality disorders? Like what are the traits, the, the characteristic uh, of, of a narcissist? And I looked at it and all the, the different, you know, traits. And I thought to myself, fucking hell, I have a few of these, you know. I definitely have a few of these. So that made me be self-conscious and look at myself and go, right, I need to keep myself in check. But but then, you know, when I look at the, the whole picture, I realize, well, I'm far from having all of them. I don't have all of them. Mm -hmm. I know people that I have been around that have many more of these traits than I have, which kind of makes me feel a bit better now because I realize that I'm not the bad, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> I'm okay. Like, I'm a loving and caring person. I, I truly care about people. I, uh, 
you know, if I see people suffering, I, I can't stop myself. I will go and see them. I'll go and talk to them. I'll, 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 you know, I'll try and help in any way, shape or form if I can. So I know I am like that. But there is so many people around us that are suffering from these these type of, of characteristic, this type of, of personality disorder. And right. and it's it's very unfortunate that you know they will not be able to see it. If you if you bring it up to them, you'll be the bad you'll be the bad guy and, and you know they'll not be able to see it. Uh, and and unfortunately you gotta distance yourself. That's the the only thing you can do is distance yourself from those people because otherwise you end up getting hurt and you know, you try every angle. If you really love those people, you want to stay around those people, you try every angle to stay with them. But right. eventually at some point, they end up making you suffer so much that you, you have to, to wait the situation and realize that I can't stay. I just have to move on. I can't stay around people that are making me suffer, whether they do it consciously or unconsciously. It, it just so when we go back to the example of the, the, the mar married woman, that is being abused physically, uh, mentally, emotionally, sexually by her husband on daily basis for many, many, many years, and they have children with them. That is even worse. I mean, this this is probably one of the worst situations that a human being can that that, that a woman or, or even a man can find himself in. And how do you? How do you find the strength? How do you find the emotional intelligence to to look at the situation without judging it and to go, right, that's what I need to do and just take action and do it? That requires more courage than, than stepping in the ring and fight somebody, you know? that's Yeah, and I think especially with that one woman I taught, what really jumped out at her and we started talking about it was the one time that the husband was trying to kill her her son, who I think was like 10 at the time or something like yeah. that, tried to jump in and save his mother. Mm. So imagine, and when I really, we talked about that, she was, oh my God, just my son feeling he had to do that for me, right? So we ended up developing a safety plan where, you know, if that was to happen again, get out of the house if you can. But if she couldn't, the son would get the younger child out of the house, go to the neighbor's. And the neighbors were willing to help. She didn't think the neighbors knew anything about their situation. I said, he'd be surprised, right? And they offered to help, but she brought it up with them. So it was a whole plan. But that's a limitation, right? When my specialty is like um, shorter seminars. Like it's easier to teach a 50-hour seminar than a four-hour. Yeah. If it's four hours, like, holy shit, I've got to eliminate, you, you know. Yeah, yeah you got to find what's pertinent. Like I said to her, in your case, we're not going to talk about bus safety, car safety, because it doesn't matter. She has an immediate threat, right? Or if I'm with a family, like I had one family book a course in their house because uh, they go, we never thought we needed self-defense, which you hear all the time because we live in an affluent area till bullets came through their child's bedroom window once. Now, the target wasn't the family, but they realized, shit, okay, maybe we're not as safe, you know, relative they are. But still, at least they were open-minded enough to think, wow, we should pursue this a bit further. And that's one thing I find frustrating is, you know, we teach kids how to swim, how to drive, you know, but they're more likely to be assaulted, the daughter, than be in a car accident or a fire. Yeah. Right? It's, it's, it's still not a life skill that's treated as seriously as as it should be, of course. Mm. So you see that that's another thing I realized that what you just said, for example, is to kind of focus on what is more likely to be happening. So focus on the the actual problem at hand, the potential risk or threat at hand. That is the most likely to happen based on the the statistics, for example, as opposed to the street fighting curriculum of uh, combatives where uh, we train for bar fights, car, car combatives, bus combatives. And, and I'm not going to lie, uh, there, is, there is a love for it. I, I, like, I like putting gear on. Yeah, I remember doing that. Yeah, it's fun. It, it's great. It's yeah. fun. It's a lot of fun. So, but, but then you realize that, whoa, I mean, is it not dangerous to install this type of response in people's brain when there possibly are some more, some more uh, 
efficient means to avoid an escape and de-escalate and it, it, it's true i mean i'm seeing it now do you know that's that's why i'm going to focus more and more and more on proper de-escalation tactics yeah i mean if i send you like a 75 year old woman to train with you and, and you you know what would you say if I said, okay, you're going to start teaching your bar fighting scenarios? You go, that's ridiculous. Well, why is it any more ridiculous for a 40, 50 year old couple that maybe don't drink to old the bars? Mm. Right? Like, you don't want to force a curriculum that's got little to do with yeah. their lifestyle. True, 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 true. You know, I, I so it's, it's just one question. I, um, obviously, I, I I don't want to get into a, a, a debate or anything. I I know your your stance on on firearms, and I know in the in the US that there's a lot of things happening right now. They want to get rid of of guns and things like that. So I mean, me as a kid, my father was in the military, and then the police. There's always been firearms at home, uh, knives, and you know I've I've gone on the shooting range from a young age with my father. Uh, I, I I was training the CQB tactics when we were in Eastern Europe and providing training for the military over there. So it's been part of my education. And my father, from a young age, uh, tried to give me that education that, you know, firearms are not dangerous. People are dangerous. And a firearm is, is an instrument uh, that could be used to hunt, that could be used to... to to defend yourself. And so I, I, I'm just looking at myself, uh, at the situation now, and I'm thinking to myself, imagine a woman that is in her 70s, her husband maybe just died recently, and she lives alone at home. Okay, she, may, she might have some kids, but they're not living directly with her. And the only mean of defense that she has is maybe the, the carabine or the shotgun uh, that her husband left behind. Do you think that in any scenarios where uh, uh, maybe perhaps multiple younger uh, thieves or, or people would break into her house, don't you think that this would be the best chance she has to, to yeah. get out of, of this situation alive? Um, I'm not sure if you do understand my position on like I, maybe guns I, I, because maybe I've got no issue with guns at all, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm supportive. So my... My issues, you know, like, let's say guns, stun guns, all these self-defense gadgets where people just shortcut to that yeah, without yeah. any training. Like, I would like to see anybody that with, you know, buys a stun gun or these tiger claws, stuff like that, that they do a course on all the steps to avoid having to use it. Yeah, yeah. But then I, I have no problem with them learning how to use a gun. I've got I have no issue with what you're saying. Mm. I just wish people didn't treat a lot of these like shortcuts to safety yeah. i'll get my stun gun yeah good luck with that right I, sure yeah do you know I, I that's something i do agree with you in fact i, I do apologize because I, I didn't really know you were saying i thought i did i thought you were kind of really anti-gun but you know not at all what you just said right now is something i have experienced on social media where the typical egotistical uh, um, attitude of a gun owner in the US is like they're gonna see a video. Sometime I'll post a video where it's I'm really fucking aggressive on the video. I'll, I'll demo biting use of the environment, and they're like, "Whoa, it's quite impressive video." Some people say, "Oh, you don't teach that stuff, you're gonna go to jail." That's not martial arts. That's that's killing. Whatever. Uh, it's just a level of aggression that I'm I'm ready to access. It's not who I am. Definitely not. But then I get certain people that go, oh, I'll just, I'll just fucking shoot you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It's like, dude, I mean, you, you just you just shown to me how insecure you are now. Like, yeah. because because you've seen a skill set that you think, oh, fuck, I wouldn't go there empty handed. So I'm going to grab my gun and shoot you instead. It's like yeah. I, that's that is a scary comment to make. I mean, okay, it's a scary video to post as well. I'm not gonna lie, you know. What I mean, it's yeah. it's it's relative, but yes, you're right. I think that there's a lot of gun owners that have no business uh, owning a firearm, and unfortunately, yeah. there are a lot. You know, they don't take into account anything that's an extension of your body mm. that could be knocked out of your hand, yeah. drop. I think it was my buddy, um. David Clark in uh, Houston, Texas, he was once certified with, say, military background, et cetera, was doing a seminar with a group of women. And 
a woman said, well, I've got my uh, pepper spray, my pepper spray, right? And he said, well, he looked at it, he goes, well, spray me in the face. She says, I'm not going to spray in the face. He pissed her off enough. She went to press it, but it ran down the front because he noticed it had expired. So imagine if she was in a situation, mm. she pulls out her pepper spray, putting all her faith in the pepper spray. Mm. It fails. So the freeze, the shock, and you probably pissed the guy off even more now. Yeah. You're going to try to use that on me? Mm. Right? So I don't like external gadgets without a prior and most but most people just put that shortcut yeah. and they don't realize and it's easy to sell some of these products right they um the fancy packaging and yeah. all that and oh. that that's that's yeah that's dangerous i think you know it's 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 a bit similar like what uh, it's something i'm exploring a bit more right now and i'm i'm in the way that i'm training i'm having a bit of a if you know if you're a martial artist you realize that there are waves there are waves. Some years I'm going to be really focused. Like last year, I was really focusing on my CQB stuff and I was doing a lot of dry fire drills and stuff like that. And this year, I'm really going back to my MMA skill set. And, and I realized that, you know, in this world, you got a lot of people that go, oh, we don't go to the ground because the ground is dangerous. You know, it's full of, it's full of uh, broken glass, dog shit, needles and used condoms. So we don't train the ground because it's dangerous to go to the ground. And it's like, dude, you just said it all. You don't train the ground. So guess what? You know, in a fight, the first thing I'm going to do is take you to the ground because you don't train the ground because it's dangerous. So it, it, there is people think that it's a go to. Oh, I'll just stab him. I'll just shoot him. But how is that going to give you an edge? It might give you an edge, but how is that going to give you an edge against somebody that can shoot, that can use a blade and that has that MMA skill set and that understand the psychology of violence and everything? It's kind of the ultimate you know, yeah, well, in, in the post I've passed a, a post in the past, I posted a lot about um, avoid the ground at all costs. And people would say, but what if you go? I said, I'm not saying don't train for the ground, yeah, yeah. but avoid it if you don't have to. But people, they, they, he said, don't go to the ground. Yeah, don't go to the ground if you don't have to, yeah. but train it because you might go to the ground. But nowadays you gotta you really gotta make sure that you mention everything because yeah. otherwise people will will take what you say and, and just 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 make what they want with it and they'll spit yeah. it out uh, through their own perceptional you know and, and uh, through their own perception and they're like well okay that's not what I said that's how you understood it so now I feel the need to really state everything you know don't leave yeah. anything out because if you don't if you forget something people are gonna are, are out there to get you oh you said, don't yeah. go to the ground <laughs> Do you know what I mean? well probably the one topic i face the most backlash is when i've said you know if anybody ever harmed like i saw i'm harming a child especially like my grandkids yeah right and i've said i hope i wouldn't kill them and mm. people go what do you mean you hope you wouldn't kill them? I didn't say I don't want to, mm -hmm. but I hope I wouldn't because I've thought enough about if I kill them, Consequences, yeah. there's that moment of it's not satisfaction. And really, if I end up in jail, having to talk to my grandkids through glass, mm. it's more important I get to be in their life than killing some asshole. You know, I'm not saying I couldn't do it. I'm not saying I wouldn't do it. Mm -hmm. But so... What, what kind of man are you? You wouldn't kill the guy? That, I said, listen to what I'm saying. To me, it's more important. I'd be in the grandkid's life. Yeah. But some people can't. That one I faced a lot of backlash over. Yeah. But I do understand that. And you know what? This is the biggest strength. You know, I'm a, I'm a very spiritual guy, man. I'm, I'm not religious in any way, shape or form. But I am I'm a very spiritual guy. And, and I believe that the real strength. You know, when I speak about real strength and now you get all the alpha males like, <laughs> what do you mean, like real strength? And, and I'm like, real strength, yeah, is lies in forgiveness. Like when you when you when you can forgive somebody, not because they deserve your forgiveness, but because you deserve to move on, because you don't deserve to go to jail, you don't deserve to bring that car, that bad karma on yourself by by giving them their karma. Do you know what I mean? So it's like you're right. This is the biggest this this is the biggest display of strength not to kill someone if they do something to your kid. And like you said, in the fire of the of the action, 
God knows what would happen. I probably would smash somebody <laughs> until 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 they yeah. until don't move anymore. But you know, it, it takes. I, I wouldn't. Of, yeah. So I hope I wouldn't. If there's camera, you don't know, right? But I'm not saying I wouldn't because I don't know the emotional. Yeah. I can guess the emotional state I would be in. Right. Yeah. And that's the scary part. And I'm not, I probably couldn't forgive them if I'm being honest. Yeah. But could I d restrain myself enough to stay in the kid's life yeah. and not be in jail because of this revenge that people think is going to be satisfaction? Yeah. It, it's revenge is satisfaction for a, for a little moment. For a little moment, yeah. it feels good, but that that is it, and it's ego driven. I mean, it is yeah. ego driven. There's there's no two ways about it. It is ego driven. Yeah. So um, to, so to to just go back onto a topic, uh, how that is something that that I'm interested to ask you is how how do you prepare a crowd of of students? How do you prepare people? Uh, that are very often uh, victims of traumas, that are afraid to open up, afraid to share their experiences, uh, afraid to fight back, afraid to look within. How do you prepare these people to open up about a very difficult subject to, to speak about, like sexual abuse, for example? How do you prepare people and I know that you you like to use humor. We were talking about this before. I know that you and Richard Dimitri like to use humor, and and I, I love you guys for that uh, because you got this ability to soften people's states so that they, they so that they're more receptive to to what you're teaching. And so that's what I was saying to you earlier before we went live. I was saying to you, so okay, how do you use humor successfully in this type of very, very controversial and difficult topic so that people don't go, what are you laughing about? There's nothing to, you know, there's nothing funny about it. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you soften people's emotional and mental states so that they are receptive to your teachings when it comes to, to a very difficult subject like this? Now, you might be disappointed my answer. And that's where I think Rich and Pam, with the extent they've taken it with trauma, would have maybe formulation, but my case is I just enter any seminar understanding maybe I don't know the people at all. They're all going to have different histories, paths, that I can't go into this with any preconceived ideas. Actually, the idea I probably go into is knowing I'm going to hear stories like that. And the biggest thing, in my opinion, is just creating an environment where they're comfortable asking questions, saying what they want. Something I've seen a lot in the past is where, especially when it's friends, right? Somebody will bring up a story, their friends will start to make fun of them, right? Mm. I have to shut that down strategically because I understand if somebody feels made fun of, even if it's their friends, guess what? Good chance nobody else is gonna open up They'll close at the down. fear of being ridiculed, right? Or made fun of. Right. So quite often I'll share a story where I fucked up. That's something I think is very effective that most instructors don't do is I encourage instructors to share the stories where they fucked up big time because then you come across as more human. It's the instructors that come across like, well, I've never made a mistake. You know, do what I tell you, be safe. No, I think it's a lot more impact when yeah. the students realize, wow, so this guy's been through these experiences, their feelings I've got. And whenever they share a story, never having judgment. Like I, I you know, I, I, th I told you I was at a high school once and a woman that ran a sexual assault center watched. And this was early days, but I used humor, but I still wasn't sure about using humor. Mm -hmm. And she said, Chris, could you come to the center and speak to the women? And I said, how would the humor go over? She said, that's exactly why I want you to come. You're not making fun of the topic. You're creating an environment that makes people comfortable to talk with the humor. So I always say I teach like a roller coaster, like funny, serious, funny, serious. I've been guilty of making it too much fun at times mm. where I've had to rein myself in and go, Chris, they're not taking this seriously now as they're striking or hitting pads. So I've had to stop and say, hey, ladies, um, stop. I've done you a big disservice. I want you to have fun but I think I've lost you. That's my fault. 
mm. not theirs. So I never force my way of teaching is seeing how the group reacts. Some are very open. Some will be want to share after class privately. Mm -hmm. Some won't share at all. So I don't have a formula rather than understanding I'm teaching individuals, not a group. Um, they've all got their experiences and who am I to judge them? Yeah. Um, understand whatever they say, they're comfortable saying it right without fear of judgment or ridicule from others. Mm. Um, exposing myself, like I always say there's three levels of stories I encourage people to share. If you're teaching, you could share a story that was in the news. That's got a certain level of impact. The second is you share a story that's been told to you personally, but the most impactful stories are if you can get the group in the room sharing their stories. That's my ultimate goal when I teach is to get the people in the room sharing the stories because then they can interact and get the exact yeah. feeling. So there's three levels to stories, how we say. So you want to kind of almost create some sort of cohesion in, in the group, like a safe safe heaven where yeah. people can share, but they know it's not going to be any judgment. You, you know what? I mean, th there's there's different different uh, groups that kind of remind me of this this sort of this sort of energy, this sort of safe heaven. Um, for me, it was plant medicine circles, you know, like working with a shaman, drinking ayahuasca, you know, and you get in a group of maybe 10 people that are all lying down with their, with their sleeping bag and their pillow, and we all drink the medicine, and we're all tripping, dealing with our things, and, and we know that there's no judgment in there. We know that when somebody feels bad, we're all going to see them. We're all there for each other. We're all kind of yeah. lifting each other up. So this is where I've experienced that sort of cohesion as a group. Uh, I'd say that it, it's a bit similar, like, you know, the groups, like the talking, the sharing groups, like like Alcoholic Anonymous and uh, Cancer and all, all that stuff where people gather up and sit in a circle and share their, uh, their traumas. Yeah. Um, th there's a lot of healing that can that can happen yeah. in those circles, and you know most people don't even understand how. Do you feel like your job is is? I know that Richard said that it isn't, but do you feel like your job is is very similar uh, uh, to a therapy? That it is some sort of therapy. Exactly what I was going to say. Good point. Is I've gone in a seminar sometimes 15 minutes without saying a word. They're all talking. And that was the best instruction, me shutting up and letting them talk to each other because they understood each other's because I haven't been in those situations, but somebody else in the group had. So sometimes the best job, to, the way to teach is to shut up and let the others talk. Oh, OK. You know, that that's something I got I to gotta learn to do. You know, I'm still very much like I'm still young and i want to put my message across and i want to kind of live my imprint in the world but you're right i mean if the best way to to help someone sometime is just to let them to let them talk and let them figure it out amongst themselves then that's definitely there's definitely some merits in there that's definitely something i should learn to do more and funny the funny thing too is the less you talk a lot of times the more they're likely to say what an amazing instructor mm. Because yeah. I, I felt heard. The group heard me. We discussed it. Yeah, it's amazing. Sometimes just shutting up is the best way to teach. Mm, okay. So do, 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 you, do you realize that, you know, very often before you actually create this safe heaven in, in the group, before you create an environment where everybody trusts each other and, and can speak freely about their experiences of violence, their, trauma, their traumatic experiences, what I see is that people tend to come to you on their own at the end and open up because they didn't want to open up in front of the group uh, by fear that, you know, because they didn't feel safe to do so. But they see you and because you 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 have portrayed yourself as who you are, a human being, somebody that does mistakes and can acknowledge and accept that and somebody that's learning from his students. And now it's like, OK. So you're putting this this image out of this is a safe person to speak to. This is a person that I can go and see and share my my trauma, my traumatic experiences with because he might have something something helpful uh, at the end to tell me. My problem for 
for a long time was to open up too much to everyone, to the wrong people. And I realized this more recently as well. I've been going through a massive shift last year, this year. Uh, realized that, you know, you shouldn't open up to everyone because not everyone is there to, to, to not to judge you. Some people you will open up to them and they'll judge you, you know. And yeah. that hurts. That hurts even more. It's like, shit, I just open up to that person because I trust that yeah. person. And now I'm being judged. And now also what I've been saying is being spoken about in my back as well. It's like, what the fuck? So it's... It's the belting act. There's no right or wrong. There's mm. no, I do it this way every time. You know, it's like we said before we went on, uh, when live is... Often when I people I certify, they'll say, Chris, could you send me an example of a for our curriculum? I go, even better, why don't you write me one out based on certain demographics, we'll pick ages, the people you're gonna teach, etc. And almost always they'll have like sexual assault in the first 15 minutes mm. as a topic. And I go, everything looks fantastic. First of all, you won't get to half of it as we said. But secondly, in my opinion, that sexual assault, you're introducing it too early yeah. before you know the group, get to develop the trust, they trust you, et cetera. So I like to use more um, not mild topics and ease your way in, get to know the group, slowly build the trust rather than, okay, sexual assault, red flag right off the bat. Yeah. That I think I think that could be too intimidating for people and yeah. shut them down. So how, how, do, how do you break the ice? Chris, if, let's say you have a group of uh, 50 women. How do you break the eyes to get people to, to get to know each other? Do you actually give them a minute to introduce themselves? And how does that work? Um, it, it might depend on the group. If it's a family, like a self-defense party or family course, I don't need to do that. Mm. They already know each other, right? But yeah. a funny story, well, not funny story actually is... Um, Probably like 25 years ago, mm. I went to do a corporate seminar at a, for a major hotel chain. So I've got about 25 women in front of me. I'm about to start teaching. They're literally shaking. Like I said, okay, I know I could be a bit creepy, you know, strange looking, but I've never had women shake looking at me like scared. And I said, I'm sorry, but I've got to ask. This is really a strange vibe. You all look nervous or scared. Could I ask why? They go, well, we did a course like this last year. I go, okay. What happened? They said, in the first minute, the instructors, they shut the lights off, started grabbing the women just to create that, like, what could happen? They like, create a sense of, I don't know, panic. Yeah. And I said, don't worry. You know, we won't be doing any. But it's funny how uh. they thought that was an effective way to get attention we also, there was another high school program. What they used to do for their simulated attacks was the girls would have to, on the last day, run into a pitch black change room. The instructor was in there waiting for them, that he would attack them. Now, I, I, in a weird way, I get what they're trying to do, right? Mm. But one of the students said, well, I wouldn't go into a pitch black change room. So I'm not going in there. Yeah. Go, well, you have to as part of the course. no. I mean, we do our simulated attacks in front of everybody cheering each other on and yeah. they're nervous enough. So it's interesting how other people try to create what they think is a good learning environment mm. where I prefer to ease into it by starting off by saying, I'm so-and-so, I'll have no answers for you. Usually the humor is right from the beginning pretty early. Mm. Like with the high school kids, I used to have them describe me with their eyes closed and I would make fun of myself and they're, you'd see them like, well, this might be fun. Mm. You know, and, and I've had too many stories like um, one girl held up a knife point in a parking lot with her friend four years after doing a four hour course with us. Mm. They escaped, got away. And she told her mother, she was, I remember what Chris taught four years ago because of the humor. So that really stuck with me how mm. humor, again, not too much. Mm -hmm. I'm really guilty of that, but there's humor, serious. It's I don't have a formula. I just know. Mm. what I think to do based on the group and talking to them. It's, it's good because with humor, you are, you, you, you're just using a certain type of positive, you know, a high frequency vibratory, like a vib vibrational energy that will 
that will open people up on a mental and emotional level. Do, do you know how it is when people are blocked, when people are closed, your information is not going to go in. I know because I am like that. If I am not uh, receptive, if I'm not in a receptive state, yeah. you'll not be able to teach me anything because I, 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 it just won't get in. Uh, it'll get in and it'll come out. But if I am in a, if, if I am in a receptive state, and for that, I, I need to put myself in a receptive state. So I'm, I, I'm self-conscious enough to be able to go, right, I'm not receptive right now. I need to put myself in a receptive state. But if you're a teacher and you understand that and you, you, you find a way to actually put your students in a, in, a, um, in a receptive state before you, 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 you put your teaching out there, then that's great. And if you can, if you can do that in a, in a natural manner that you don't even know how you do it, it's just, it's just natural. You, know? you, you just look at the type of crowd that you have and you know how to communicate with them straight away. And I think the biggest, um, the most fun I ever had was teaching the high school kids, mm. right? And they're almost the best crowd to teach because I go into high school, the kids are there, not because they wanted to be there maybe, right? Mm. And on the first day, I can't tell you how many times a 14-year-old girl would say to me, you're going to talk for a whole hour? Oh, my God, boring, right to my face yeah. before it even started. But then, so that was my challenge, right? And five minutes in, you see them like, oh, this isn't what I thought. This might mm. be, that was always my that was my, I'm going to get this group, right? They're going to, you know, and 99% of the time it would go great. I had the odd group. Like I had one group once the teacher goes, Chris, uh, this group of girls is really different. Um, don't be surprised if they don't laugh, right? And get into it. And my ego, I'm like, come on. I'm funny like shit. They're going to laugh. I had 60 minutes of the girls like this. Nothing. Mm. It was, but it was a good experience. Like people go, oh my God, you must have felt terrible. But it was just another environment I could see. How can I get better, right? And want to know why it was like that. So standing all down about it, I looked at it like, wow, what did I learn from a group that didn't smile once at me for 60 minutes? Mm. But luckily that was like once in 30 years, right? But you get different yeah. people. Like in a seminar with, um, again, men, I did a corporate seminar and one guy was just, asking just to gain attention asking stupid questions challenging everything yeah. and i'm cool with questions love questions that challenge me but i almost expect when i teach men to be jumped at some point by a guy so i'm doing a corporate seminar they've got suits on the women just i guy goes to the bathroom i'm teaching comes out jumps me goes for a choke i bite him he just goes you fucking bit me Oh, yeah, you just jumped me. He runs out of the room, all embarrassed, and the women are laughing. But it's like, I I expect it with guys. But why do we even have to like get to that point? You know? Yeah, that's very unfortunate. I mean, I the, the way that my father taught me, because that was part of uh, my education as well when we were providing training uh, with my father, he said, there's always going to be one or two guys in the crowd that are going to be testing you, and you got to make an example out of them. So, yeah, a few, a few times we had to kind of take people down or put put finger into somebody's eye a little bit yeah. to make them understand that, yeah, that's that's enough. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, yeah, unfo that's unfortunate because people size you up. I know when I, when I go to, uh, especially when I go to another country for the first time, and I teach a group of people that I never taught before. I mean, very often some of them have seen my videos, so I, you know, they, they know what I'm about. But sometimes people are like dead, like serious, looking at you, thinking, "What? Right? What is this guy gonna teach me? Yeah, yeah. It doesn't look. It doesn't look that tough." Uh, it's it's weird that you got you you actually have to impress people before they start taking you seriously. It's like in that movie, do you remember uh, Bodyguard with Kevin Costner? Yeah, yeah. He says to him, you, you don't look like a bodyguard. And he goes, that's my, that's my disguise. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that's why I don't know about yourself, but usually the person that's going to jump you is the one that doesn't have a lot of experience. The people with a lot of experience want to get more, mm. more knowledge. The guy that, you know, like I, I would do family courses with a family and quite often the father would say, I won't be joining you. Okay. Just my wife and kids will do it. I'll go, why? Because I already know all this stuff. 
right. right? So I'd say, well, if you could do me a favor, you could assist me. Yeah. So I'm appealing to their ego. And generally through the teaching, they'll all have to say, oh, I just, thanks. I learned a lot there. I didn't, I, you know, I was speaking out my ass before yeah, yeah. as a male thinking I could protect my family, et cetera. So yeah, it's interesting how they, uh, yeah. How, how, how do you actually go about like teaching families? So you, you actually go into uh, families' homes and you, and you, you formulate a game plan based on their own home and, yeah. So are you are you are you talking about like an uh, like an escape route like a, like um uh, uh, like a panic room or a safety room and things like that? It could be. I still would say eighty percent is my regular curriculum. You yeah. know, intuition, all the, the, the topics that are relative to them. Then I could also adapt it to the house, the yeah. layout. You know, if they've got an upstairs, mm -hmm. are there any escape routes out the upstairs? So I could really tailor it to their needs. Yeah. Um, Like one example story is I, I was on a Saturday morning. We're talking about home safety and not opening the door to people, right? Talk to the door, et cetera. Right after I did that topic, guy rings the doorbell, yes, guy yes. at the door. The family looks up and it's like, you set this up, didn't you? you <laughs> fast. I'm like, no, I said it's perfect time. I didn't honest, right? So the mother goes, I'll deal with it. She goes to the door. She's talking through the door. It's a service guy. He's getting upset because she's not opening the door. Tell her she's rude. All the stuff I just talked about, mm. right? So she goes, make an appointment to check the furnace. It was for the furnace. She comes in shaking. I go, that was fantastic. And so what's wrong? She goes, if it was yesterday, I would have opened the door. Probably mm. nothing would have happened. But seeing how upset he was getting made me realize Again, I don't know that person on the other side of the door. Yeah. I had to convince him I hadn't set it up. It was just perfect luck alignment, right? Okay, but yeah. yeah, so the family depends. Like I had one family too where the two teenage kids, they didn't want to be there on a Saturday morning, right? So I'm talking to them saying, your parents are making you do this, aren't they? Mm. Yeah, kind of. they're trying to be polite to me. They gave me a They loved it. But again, that's, you know, because I address stuff they'd be interested in. And uh, so really, it's still our basic course, but adapting it to specific, um, yeah, the yeah. environment, or maybe they've got specific reasons they call me, right? Yeah. I, fi I find it really interesting, like having the ability to uh, to tailor a program based on people's needs. I mean, that, that's something I'm, I've been working on as well. I, I, I think my brain works very similarly as well, where I'm like, I know I have like different modules that I'm planning to do, uh, like home security, like maybe like taxi, like taxi companies, railway companies, airline yeah. companies, where I'm like, I already know that I can fit my curriculum and put it into that environment and then adapt the the outer structure of my module based on the, the environment. But that's one thing I was thinking of doing as well, that uh, an idea that I had quite a while back is going to shop owners and develop a program for shop owners um, and, and work on uh, like robbery scenarios and things yeah. like this uh, in their shop on the Sunday, uh, on the Sunday during the day or something like that. And yes, I did a seminar once for a walk-in clinic because mm. they would have people coming in looking for drugs, right? So we did mm. the seminar right in their clinic the actual environment where they would experience something like this happening, yeah. you know, where the layout of the rooms, could they get in? Did they have good locks on the doors? So we mm -hmm. did the summoner right in the walk-in clinic. So yes, that's a good idea. Yeah. Oh, that's, that's great. So I'm just, I'm just thinking about what, what we could be speaking about. What about, what about, what about like, you know, students that have, traumas and that are really suffering heavily from from a trauma based on, on on a violent situation that they have faced maybe in the past maybe in their childhood something very prominent in in their life first of all you know if you get people like this in your course then that means that it took them a lot of courage to even make the first step to go right i'm gonna go and seek uh, expert ad advice and training Um, how do you adapt 
to these people when they are uh, uh, in a group or when they are in, that can be individually or as part of a group. How do you make sure that you don't make it worse, basically? Because... I realize that it's very easy to say the wrong thing, even without without wanting to do it and end up making things worse for a person that's actually made a massive effort to come and see you. I think letting them know right off the bat that a lot of the content could be triggering and that at any point they, they can leave, right, or sit or wait, ask questions after, because it's impossible to know especially because I wouldn't deal with regular clients. It was always brand new people for the most part mm. I'd be dealing with. So I'm sure there's times when I said something and maybe the, I can't think of them walking out, but letting them know they can walk out mm -hmm. if they're uncomfortable and note with their judgment. Like I remember once I was doing a drill, you've probably done this too, where um, for conflict resolution, where I just stood like six feet from her, looked at her. That was the drill. Just stare at the person and they take it in rather than get in their face and yell and scream, et cetera. Mm. Well, I just looked at this one woman and that just freaked her out and she ran out of the room. And I went, I said, I, I'm sorry. You know, she was no, just the way you looked at me is how my ex used to look at me and used to be abusive. Oh. But I had no way of knowing yeah. how he looked at her. Right. But she was open to talking about it, but there's times where you just can't know. Yeah. Right. And something is going to come up. But again, making them feel comfortable to leave or bring up what they want or not bring up because I'm not a therapist. Right. So there's yeah. times when all I can do is try to provide the resources and encourage them to seek them out because I'm I good at what I do, but I know what I can't do, what's not my area. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's critical as well. Right. Some people want to think, well, I know so much about this. I, I can be the one to fix them. No, I, I think I'm pretty good handle on knowing, okay, Chris, that's beyond and being telling them that, Look, this is beyond my, my capability, my education, yeah, yeah. you know, but I can help you find some, yeah. perhaps the right person. Yeah. Right. You, you know what? It, I'm just thinking of a situation here in, in, my, in my head. Look, for example, if I'm having a look at a very controversial module aspect of self-protection is working, uh, it's like counter-weapon tactics and things like this, where now we're looking at something really dangerous, very difficult to pull off, especially for somebody that's got no training or almost pretty much almost impossible if you're facing somebody with determination and, and, and aggression and somebody that's armed and that's made the decision to hurt you um and i'm just thinking for example i mean i have as part of my um uh, counter blade tactics so it's a counter knife uh program where i have a powerpoint presentation i got slides that go with it and as part of my uh of my uh slides of my presentation I got two or three slides that are showing uh, some very difficult pictures of knife wounds and for people to understand the difference between slash wounds and puncture wounds and, and defensive wounds, primary cuts and things like that. Do you think that this is... A, I've, I don't, is it a good idea? I've been told that it's, it's good in some aspect. It's good for people to have that call to you know that that reality call of right this is what a blade can do yeah. or do you think that it would be too much for some people to see pictures like this yeah when rich and i've done nice seminars i've shown videos as well of mm -hmm. nice setups etc but i think again it depends on the group and how you introduce it if you start off the seminar okay let's get to the reality of boom right in the face the first mm -hmm. five minutes without knowing the people again yeah, yeah, that would be too much. But as you ease into the topics, right? Okay, it's getting a bit more serious. I'd like to show some slides. If any of you might, might be uncomfortable, yeah. feel free to leave. I completely understand. It's still not easy for me to look at these pictures, mm. even with my experience, right? So I think, again, it's a lot of it's timing and getting to know your group because a lot of people will show up thinking they're prepared to do it yeah. when they're not. Yeah. Right. So they've got good intentions. I want to learn all this. I'm ready. I can do it. 
but they don't know what to expect. So they don't realize that some of it might be too much for them. Mm. Right. So if they don't realize it, it's hard for you to sometimes know, right? Because they're in there with a brave face, right? Yeah. Just not knowing that someone's going to trigger them. So it's, it's, you can't get it right all the time. So you see here, it's almost like there is a bit of a, I mean, not almost, there, there is a massive contradiction between these two extremes when it comes to the personality that it takes to, 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 to be a self-protection instructor or a combative instructor, whatever you want to call it, where on one side, I'm a human being, you're a human being, and I, I'm like you, I have no difficulties uh, showing people that I am only a human being, and I can do mistakes, and I can be wrong, and I can be scared too, and you know, I can cry, uh, I can, I can, I'm an emotional guy, I can do these things, and I'm not going to judge anyone for doing it, but on another hand, I'm also a fighter, uh, I, I've, not fight, I've not fought for, for quite a few years now, but I'm looking to get back into it, And when you get on the ring, you, you have to work on that image of uh, having no emotion, showing no pain, no fatigue, no, no, uh, none of that stuff, because it's, it's very unhealthy to show that to your, to your opponent. So do you think that it's a good idea to kind of work both aspects and to find the right, the, the, you know, the right balance and equilibrium between the two? and just know which one to employ at which moment. You yeah, and I think it's like Richard probably said countless times, you know, knowing the difference between self-defense, martial arts, and fighting, right? And when you're teaching them and introducing the topics, yeah, going with it, like when it's important for you to show your vulnerability, teaching, yeah. show it. Yeah. If it's, you know, so you can still be vulnerable, but I've still got this mindset. If I need to do this, I'm going to do it. And it's because I'm vulnerable, I've adapted this strong mindset mm. to protect what's important in my life. You know, it's like I always said, um, I'm not sure a, a dangerous biker with knives who likes to fight is dangerous, of course. But I'd be more scared of an angry pregnant mother with the right mindset of doing whatever to protect your child. Mm. To me, she's a lot scarier because she'll eat your heart mm. to protect your child. Yeah, yeah. Right. So that's where, again... You know, we think fighters, strong mindset, sure. But there's that mother, that father that seems quiet, timid, that probably has a mindset 10 times stronger than a lot of these fighters. And maybe they don't know it. Yeah. And it's finding and tapping into it. Like when I have discussions with people, mindset, oh, I'll try to defend myself. Then you bring in, you know, your child. Well, what if you tried and your mom, you left your child alone because you died. So, well, my mom tried to fight back. Mm. you know, finding what that trigger is, effective trigger to get yep. that right mindset that for everybody it's different, you know. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a wide range of, you know, showing your vulnerable side, how you fuck up, showing some of your couple, what you've done well, you know, like um, the book I wrote on conflict resolution, I share a story where, you know, road rage, I've cut people off by accident Nine times out of ten, I apologize, wave to them. They're fine. They got what they wanted. I accept the responsibility. Once a guy followed me all the way into Ottawa, a city near here. So I went to a public store, parking lot, lots of people around. Gets out of his car, you fucking asshole, you cut me off. So I'm like, fucking asshole. That's the third time I've heard that today. My wife called me that this morning. And he stopped, started laughing. And we talked, and I apologized. Right. So sharing out the humor work there. But I've got times when I've, you know, met aggression with aggression. And I remember one time because my family was nearby, I was worried about them that I'm thinking, Chris, you're yelling back at the guy doing exactly what you teach people not to do. Yeah. Right. And so I discussed that. Is it good that I realized I was making a mistake or is it bad because I make a mistake and I know I'm doing it? Yeah. You see what, what you just said here is something very difficult. And I know even though, you know, we, we, we teach the proper de-escalation tactics and empathy and, you know, make it about the person. Don't, don't, call, don't call them a liar, you know, don't confront them in any way, shape or form. Uh, I always say, you know, the, the best form of uh, de-escalation comes from customer service. 
because customer service has got the best de-escalation tactics because not only do they want to calm you down, they want to sell you something. So they'll try every single tricks out of the book to put you in the right receptive mode for, for them to sell you something. But it's like, I'll be honest with you, man, like, I'm a good person. I, I, I hate to fight. I, I think hurting, fighting and hurting people is stupid. But if somebody is in my face and he's being aggressive and I feel threatened, it's going to be very difficult for me to, to keep a cool head and to smile and to... I mean, not to say that I've not done it, because I have done it successfully quite many times. But in my head, there's still a voice that's saying, motherfucker, you make one more step, I will drill you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but it, it's kind of internalizing this and then put a completely different body language on the outside. That's, hey, man, what, what is this about, man? Can't we just talk about it, man? Do you know what I mean? And have this, this neutral face on that is not aggressive, but that does also doesn't seem scared, that... that assertive body language and it's a very difficult thing to do man especially if you feel threatened and somebody's in your face blah, blah, blah. it's like yeah of all the violence prevention and self-defense stuff people struggle with mm. the conflict resolution stuff the most yeah. there's so much emotion involved right and challenging of egos being accused like we've done seminars where richard's teaching his content everybody's like oh that makes perfect sense everything's great they do the drills and richard's like you're all doing what you fucking did before you did you not hear anything i said you all agreed it made sense people are like, i know but for 40 years i've been speaking like this mm. so sometimes all you can do is make people aware of some better strategies and hopefully when they go home, they think about it and think where they might adopt it or bring it in line, right? So, yeah, that's the most challenging I find is somebody in your face. And if you've got loved ones with you, it's even more, you yeah, know, fuck, it's, it's more of a challenge. Yeah. It, it, it is about, in, it's almost like about installing a new piece of software on the operating system. You got your operating system and then your your de-escalation software is like, hey man, stay back or back the fuck up or which is not, this is not de-escalation. This is boundary setting. And that's why a lot of people don't see the difference between boundary setting and proper de-escalation tactics. The boundary setting, which is, uh, listen, man, can you just stay, can you just hold up there, please? Yeah. Or stay away from me or back the fuck up with a little yeah. bit of an ex escalation in, in, yeah. in terms of intensity. Uh, other than, Okay, man, uh, you're obviously upset. Uh, how can I make this up to you, man? Do you want to? Do you want to speak about it? What What did I do to 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 piss you off, man? How can How yeah. can I make it right? You know, I mean, that is what we should do. There's yeah. Very few people, and, and I know, I know, uh, I know people even that teach uh, supposed to supposedly you know teach de escalation as part of their system, and I, I've seen them a few times in the car when somebody did something wrong, just pointing the finger out, and I was like, dude. <laughs> <laughs> you're an internationally recognized yeah. uh, self-protection yeah. instructor bro and you just you just show yeah. the fit to the, to the driver yeah. in front of you like a lot of people teach verbal escalation after calling it de-escalation you mm -hmm. know like yeah take one step closer i'll fucking knock you out well, <laughs> how, like how stupid and unstrategic as well as that i know you just told the person what you're going to do right yeah, yeah. but again and i find the biggest thing is is because so many people get into these arguments or fights when they know they're wrong. Mm -hmm. I say just simply apologizing. Most times will take just be accountable. I fucked yeah. up. I'm sorry. Most times that's it. Done. Yeah. Right? I have I have very, a very little problem doing that. Just saying I'm sorry and just walk walk away. Yeah. So how about what about posturing? Do you believe that there is some type of situation where posturing would be uh, posturing aggressively would be the best option, or is it always not a good option? I'd say certain people can get away with it. You know, like I think probably a lot of um, cause I've never worked in the um, like the bar scene, nightclubs, whatever. But I'm sure a lot of those guys posturing right can be very effective. Okay. They're big, intimidating, etc. But it's like anything. There's no one strategy is going to work every time, 
right? Yeah. You want to have that toolbox of uh, strategies and knowing which one might be best um, at the time, different professions, right? They're going to want you use different strategies, mm -hmm. but I say, whatever strategy you use, can you still be a kind, caring human being? Yeah. Can you still be kind and be big and intimidating looking, but use, you know, be still, be, so I think it's all, that comes down to that. Yeah. It's, it's, it's if you're an asshole, that's going to shine through regards with strategy you use, I think, quite often. It's true. So, so you know, that that's one thing I was I was always saying to uh, to my students, and I still do. The most difficult moment in self-protection is, is finding the moment where you need to go. When I mean when you need to go, where, where you need when you need to go physical. And generally it is between the last insult and the first punch. So, and that moment is a very often is a fraction of second. And so, okay, we, we speak about environmental awareness, situational awareness, and mainly behavioral awareness so that you can spot pre-threat indicators and, and, you know, kind of respond to the situation rather than react to it. But that is the most difficult moment to, to, to find out. And I love um, Rich, Rich and Pam's... Um, de-escalation model where you're going to try to uh, to solve the guy's problem in order to find out what sort of person you have in front of you. And now you know that if, if you're indeed facing uh, a good person having a bad day, then you will, nine times out of ten, you will you will find a way to de-escalate it. But you will know now who you're facing. Maybe you're facing a sociopath. Maybe you're facing a narcissist. Maybe you're facing somebody that that has got an agenda. He's decided that he wanted to punch you in the face. He just wants to want a reason, a bit of a trigger to, to do so. And he's waiting for you to give him that trigger. Yeah. So it, it, when you know you're facing that person, now your preemption is so much more likely to work because you got the element of surprise on your on your side. Rather than you make one more step and I'll fucking drop you, you cunt, which is what you're thinking in your head. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, but I think people go to one two extremes: either they hit far too soon, mm. or they just don't hit, thinking the problem's going to go away. Mm. Right? It is challenging, especially for um, people little trained to know when to hit. And that's where the drills become valuable, right? You can tell people, okay, if they're not listening to you, they're in your face, they're getting aggressive, strike them. But it's still too simplistic for a lot of people, right? It, it tells yeah. there's so much emotion. But that's a case where the drills become very valuable. You get a lot of the violence prevention stuff without live training. But the conflict resolution, I think, is so critical to do it in person. Mm. If you can, even then, it's not real, right, when you're doing drills, right? And so... I find, yeah, the two extremes, either people hit way too soon yeah. or they just don't. They keep hoping the problem's going to go away. Yeah. Plus, right. it takes a certain mindset to hit someone first, to be yeah. preemptive. It, it does take a certain mindset. Like, you need to have that switch on in your head where you're like, right, it's time to go now. Boom. You know? Uh, so, when it comes to de-escalation, you see that there are various drills. I think that it's interesting to have a look at drills for de-escalation tactics. And it's like drills where, okay, you, you might have an uh, upset person and maybe you're not the person in the crowd is going to get involved. And it might be a bit hot uh, in terms of the energy, but there's no fight exploding. So, so that people don't always get used to, right, I try to de-escalate and eventually it ends up having to escalate in a physical fight because then it's on the hard drive. Then you're like, okay, de-escalation, fight, de-escalation, fight. Instead of, right, de-escalation, oh, it worked, no fight. I managed to walk away intact and the other person managed to do the same. So uh, have, have you got things like that, like, like role plays and things like that that you do for de-escalation? Yeah, see, because um, when I met Richard, I've been doing this for 15 years already. And everybody, you know, when they think of Richard's content, they'll shredder, 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 shredder. And as great a concept as it is, I say, fuck that. To me, what stood out was his conflict resolution stuff, mm. right? That, I, my violence prevention, I've always been very, well, my physical stuff for the most part, but that conflict stuff was what I was missing, I was more the boundary setting type guy, 
you know, back off, stay away, right? Um, and as I was teaching, knowing, like, this isn't right. It's not enough, yeah. right? Like, I wish, I've always had a goal of keeping stuff as simple as possible, but it's difficult to do with the conflict stuff if you're being honest, yeah. right? That's why I like the drills where, um, you know, once you've explained all the principles and concepts of conflict resolution, the rules where you have, okay, in a drill, you're a good, you're dealing with a good person having a bad day. So you do the, you do the drill knowing they can be de-escalated, yeah. right? And you get the feedback after. Well, you kind of escalated me when you said this. So you talk, then you do the drill with the bad person. You know you're going to have to hit them at some point. So you get a good sense of that. But then when you introduce, okay, you don't know who you're dealing with now. Hmm. It takes a big jump, right? Because it's not yeah. certain, right? So that's why I do find those drills very valuable. Yeah. You know, and then creating them in scenarios that the people could identify with and uh, and that. So. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. So... Do 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 you want to maybe speak about uh, something slightly different and, and call it a day or uh, how, how do you are you feeling, Chris? I'm cool. It's always how my voice is uh, standing up. Or if you want to do it, if there's enough interest, we do it another time as well. I'm cool with that. It's pretty good. It's, it's it's up to you. I mean, we can we can if you want, we can have another like little twenty minute or half an hour or less. It's it's up to you. Well, try to if you've got any pressing questions or um, well, I, I can feel my voice starting to okay, okay. struggle a bit, but we can do it another time as well. But I'm happy to for answer sure. any more if you have any final questions or for sure, for sure. Well, I just wanted to ask about about you a bit more, maybe like you know, to speaking a bit about personal development and how how you felt like your job made you evolve as a person, and and you know, I have a just a few a few questions that I ask most people towards the end of sure. the interview. So, um, have you ever had any any moment of a big moment of epiphany? Uh, anything that really made you shift your perspective about life, about how you view yourself, how you view the world, and your place in it? Something that made you really change drastically. <laughs> I know the grandkids being born was a huge one because mm. I remember my first thought is shit, I got to live another 20 years to make sure they're okay. Right. But I welcomed it, etc. But I think it's funny because when I started in this industry, I thought it was to just, you know, run my own business because I was always entrepreneurial, you know, but I, but I felt different where geez, I'm going to start doing something where I can actually help people purpose Mm -hmm. Right. Because I, mean, I started the business, two babies at home. So going from a good income to nothing, thinking, what the fuck did you just do? Mm. Right. And but then slowly teaching. And I'm one of these guys that whether it's good or bad, I just never give up. A lot of challenges in this industry, as you know, it's not like I'll just start teaching self-defense because to make a full time living teaching self-defense mm. as a mobile company is pretty challenging. You know, it's not like I have a school with regular students, et cetera. And even COVID's changed. Like one of the other guys I certified, he's handling all the high school stuff. I'm just strictly focusing on online stuff now and, or personal if somebody wants to train with me. And that brings a lot of challenges, um, but it's like starting a new business. Mm. But just the feedback, but I think I shared with you once where how I started the business and I'm like 10 years and I'm like, why am I so obsessed with this? it doesn't make sense. It's got to be more than money. Right. And then the one night I woke up at about one in the morning, just bawling my eyes out. Right. Remembering like, how I was in grades. I got a wash. That? That's interesting. Oh. <laughs> Come on. Hey, on you go. Off you go. Off you. Whoa. 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 Fuck off. <laughs> That's not de-escalation. <laughs> yeah, but dude, <laughs> I've been nice, like she's she's fucking flying around my. Come on, I'll try. Hammer fist. Oh, that's it. No, no, no. But I, I love I love nature, man. I don't I, I don't want to have to uh, hurt animals. You know what I mean? That's it. She's gone now. Um. Yes, man. Look, you, you know, it's like I, so. I think yeah, you 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 shared some some of those uh, some of those 
dude, you're gonna have to remind me the last 10 seconds of what you were saying. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. So I remember I was like 10 years into this, thinking, why am I so obsessed? It's not just about making money, right? Mm -hmm. And that's when, like, one night I woke up at like one in the morning, just bawling my eyes out, right? Because I remembered back in like grade six or seven, a guy had broken into the classroom, locked the door, started to sexually assault the girl in our classroom, right? And we as kids all hid under the desks, et cetera, et cetera. So I remember thinking, I, I'm, I was like at the time with 30 some years of age, I blocked that out. And it didn't happen directly to me. It did. I was there. I blocked out what the hell did she go through? You know, this young girl. <laughs> <laughs> what did this young girl go through in grade six or seven? Did it change her life? You know, how did it change her life? She, I tried to search this girl for over 30 years. I can't find her. I wanted to tell her, you know, how what she went through changed my life direction, wanting to help people. But now I even had a more a bigger purpose when I realized one of the reasons that's doing the trauma, right, that she must have gone through and I blocked that out. So that's always been in the back of my head. I still think of that every, you know, couple of months, what she went through grade six or seven being sexually assaulted in the classroom. Mm. And that's always, and then the countless people I've spoken to where they've gone through horrific, you know, woman being sexually assaulted by her brother and father at the same time and just countless stories like that. And if I can make any tiny difference, that's my, that's my purpose, you know, like when people share stories where their students um, survived an attack and they treat that like a success story. Mm. I don't, I feel terrible. Somebody even had to defend themselves. Yeah. And I don't, I don't take credit for that because if, if I had a student, didn't defend themselves successfully. Am I going to take blame for that? Mm. No. So it's interesting how self-defense instructors also take credit for stuff. Sure, we provide the information, but after that, we don't know how it's used or what's mm. remembered or all you can do is do the best you can to give the education to people and hope they never need it. Yeah. Oh, it's true. No, it's true. It's true. It's a good, it's, it's a good, um, how you say it's a good motivation, you know, to just to just think to yourself, right, you know, I made somebody's life easier or I helped someone getting out of a situation where they could have maybe lose, lost their life or or get traumatized for life. That, that's what a lot of yeah. merit, what, what we do. Just in everyday life, even when somebody goes, you know, I was afraid to ask for that job promotion, but mm. a confidence that I learned your core, like, and some people don't realize until years later. Mm. Again, what they learn. That's why, again, every little thing you say to somebody, you don't know the impact it might be having on them. So I never take that for granted. Yeah. Okay. So, if if you could if you could go back in the past and change something about your life, uh, would you? And if and if you did, what would it be? I don't think I would change. Oh. It's, it's it's a catch-22 because I still deal with a lot of guilt about being away from my kids so much when they were young. Because mm. I started traveling, teaching when they were like three and four years of age, doing 50,000 kilometers a year, like on a Sunday bye, I'll see you next Friday, over 15 years till I lost my voice and I had to make some changes, right? Mm. And just, I, I still have regrets about that. But I used to take the kids to schools to see what I was doing. This is why dad's away. And I think they realize why it was so important. Mm. But I have that regret. That's why I don't travel so much now. I okay. Think. Yeah. Yeah, it's good to get to spend a bit more time with your kids. The grandkids now, yeah. Grandkids. The older kids are all grown up and that. So, but yeah, so I, I don't want to make that not mistake. Yeah. I wouldn't take it back. I hopefully helping people, but with the grandkids, yeah, I want to be there for like. Uh, I don't want them going. Where's Guy? Why is he away this week? Uh, right. Okay. So if if um, if you could change something about the world, anything at all, you know, even if you had like 
superpowers and you could change something about the world, would you change anything? And if you did, what would it be? I think just for parents, somebody was saying not to take, like their children growing up, listen to them, watch them. Just, it's not a change. I just wish more people would do that. Mm. Just we're raising their kids and I don't know how else to explain it. Just pay attention to the kids, mm. support them, talk to them. Don't treat them like accessories. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Cause they're the ones that are going to be raising kids eventually. You know, it's, I think that we, I have just so much more. I think some of my projects moving forward are going to be more related to younger kids too. Okay. Oh, that's, that is good. It's almost like, yeah, mm -hmm. like kind of learn from your children. Like if you were back yeah. to school, you know, that's it. You're, 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 you're a parent now. You're back to school. Yeah. So yeah. I got last two questions. This next question, I ask it as well to everyone. Because that's interesting to me because I, I mm -hmm. have experienced some, some pretty weird shit in my life. But have you ever experienced anything that you couldn't explain in a rational manner in your life? Maybe trivial, you know, because I'm not a religious person either, right? It's sort of like uh, my voice. Why, why was my fucking voice taken from me for the most part? You know, when you're doing, you're out teaching and trying to do good things and your fucking voice is gone. You know, people will, there must be a reason, a purpose. Well, fuck the purpose. I was doing what I wanted to be doing. Now it's gone. Mm -hmm. But then then there's a challenge I had to adapt. So that's maybe a trivial one. Everybody's got shit in their life that they're going to deal with. But that's when I still think about sometimes like, why was my voice? I mean, it, it sounds like it's not taken, mm. but for me to teach a group of 30, 40 people for four hours is a real do you struggle. think that, Do you think that maybe that the, the purpose of you losing your voice is so that you could spend a bit more time with your grandchildren? Yes, baby. And also writing a book. I never imagined I would write a book. I, thought, I can't write a book. I barely got through English in high school, but I wrote the book, one of my most proud moments. And I do so much writing now and I enjoy it. So that's one benefit to losing my voice as well. Yes, I, I'm, I'm not out teaching as much, so I'm back with family. And also I write a lot more and I never imagined writing so much. So you, now, now you're living a different types of imprints, maybe something that will last longer, in fact, because you know that yeah. writings last longer than, than recordings and voices and videos. Yeah. I know, but I still like to talk. Of course. I, <laughs> I don't know what you're saying. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, last, last question, Chris. What, what, what's your message for younger generations? Oh, fuck. Um, I don't want to sound like this, a cliche, you know, like just when I see the grant, like support each other, like the bullying topic and I, mm -hmm. just support each other, be friends. There's so much shit that goes on that's just unnecessary based on so many parent upbringing egos. I, I don't really have an answer for it. I just... There's so much. I remember Rich once said to me, "Could I get frustrated wanting to help everybody?" Rich goes, "You can't help everybody. You can only help one person at a time." But I want to help everybody, so it's overwhelming. Yeah. So I—that's my answer. Is it's overwhelming? I don't know. I want to help every kid that you know, every kid that's born in the family that don't have a chance. Mm. I want them to have a chance. But how do you reach them? And you can't reach some of them. It's accept, not accepting, but but it's that you can't help everybody but help as many people as you can and do that through the kids. Like if I could teach my grandkids to be supportive of their friends, like I talked to my grand, I said, what if you saw somebody being bullied? We, and they said, come over here, help us bully the kid. Would you do it? Mm. And my grand, I said, no, I wouldn't help them. It's not right. That's what I would like, you know, kids to stand up for themselves and for yeah. their friends and not join the crowd of followers that just mindlessly bully and, treat other people and adults to the treat other people like shit just because they think it's 
you know, cool. I don't know. Yeah. Sorry. No, no probs. So, uh, do do you wanna do you wanna put your plug in your your website, your courses? Uh, I I bought I recently bought a course from you, and uh, I'm still I'm I'm still in the middle of watching it. I th I think it's great. Um, I'll I'll tell you which one it is. Yeah. Uh, where is it? One sec. It's somewhere here. Uh, one sec. I'll I'll find it. It's somewhere here. Uh, one sec. Where is it? Where is it? Oh, did that? I? I, I might have closed it by mistake. But it, it's it's a course. I've I've seen it on the. Um, on Facebook, like maybe last month, and I got that. I started to look into it, and there's some some great pointers in there. So if you want to plug that in, uh, if you got a website, you got courses for sale. To be my guest, man. Yeah, I've got my main site of that for 30 years is the um, Safe International Biz, but we're getting a lot of attention now on my. Uh, it's like Self Defense Online Podia.com. I'm not even sure, but if you find me on Facebook, um. Christopher Roberts or Safe International, a lot of stuff there because we've got the website with a lot of our products, the violence prevention, conflict resolution, the physical stuff, this courses with Richard and Pam as well that we've done together. So, or just email me at um, Chris Roberts at safeinternational.biz if you have any questions and uh, I'm doing a lot of certifications these days and stuff like that. So, Nice, nice, great. So if, if anyone is interested in what Chris does, make sure to check him out, check the, the website or find him on uh, on Facebook. You're on Instagram as well, I believe. Yes, yeah, the only one that's a problem is TikTok. They ban almost everything I put up. It's ridiculous, yeah. but I won't uh, I won't I won't get into that right now. They like, they like stupid stuff into if you yeah. stupid stuff, then you'll get a lot of you'll get a lot of success. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so for, for anyone that wants to see this podcast or to share it, you can find it on the live section of my YouTube channel. That's called Adrenaline Combatives. Uh, it, it, it's there already. So share it widely, spread the love, and uh, we'll see you next time, guys. <laughs>